In today's video, I restore this old antique door. So I got it for free because the people who were getting rid of it had left it outside for a couple of years and the weather had gotten the better of it. So this rough looking side is the outside. Here's kind of a flyby view. This is the interior side of the door. You can see they have the little brass hooks to hang curtains and then the hardware is still on there in this video. And here, the dark spots, it's actually water because it was raining a couple of days before I went and picked this up. So again, somebody had done some less than ideal patchwork and then this piece right here was one of the worst parts of it. Otherwise, not too much rot. So I took the hardware off in this video and didn't realize it till later, but you can see that's where it was sitting on the ground and just a little bit of discoloration. It wasn't really rotten, which is good news. There were two big water spots where the hinges were, where kind of rust and water had been trapped over the years, and then one little divot there. So here I'm trying to just poke a screwdriver in, see if there's any really rotten soft spots, and thankfully there were not. So it's a little soft on one or two spots just because it was still wet, but otherwise it was in good shape. And the glazing were the around the window to keep it in was still in good condition. The decorative trim is gone on the exterior portion of the door, but the inside still had most of it. So the first step of the video is just removing the hardware, which was pretty easy for the most part except for getting out the mortise and lock from the inside. That took a little bit more time than the rest of it. And you can see this video took me longer than any video I've done so far, so I have a beard in some portions of the video and I don't in others and wearing different shirts throughout. For this side, I had to actually scrape away, away the corrosion and grime and eventually get the screws to come out. They didn't want to cooperate at first. So I, I can't tell. I'm pretty sure this was, at a bare minimum, it was a brass plated uh, cover here, but you can see later once I take it and kind of scr scratch off all this spot, it's not going to be completely brass. And the, one of the more unique finds was a paper clip that somebody had wedged here on the bottom portion of the lock. I'm not sure if that was intentional or just a fluke, but it actually serves no purpose. And this is what the parts look like once you got them disassembled. And the knob, I didn't realize that the piece up top I could have gotten off had I pried a little harder, but I didn't understand the inner workings at first and didn't want to mess anything up, so I took my time. And here I tried to be gentle with just some light wire brushes and they weren't going to get it cut, so went over to the wire wheel and spent a lot of time. So I'm not going to show you that whole video, but I will show you the start of the knobs, which are completely brass and polished up really nicely, as you can see. So the exterior plate and then the deadbolt and a couple of other pieces I soaked in a vapor rust so that way it could go and creep inside the inner workings here of the lock. I got all the big chunks of rust and grime and everything off of all the pieces and then just let them soak overnight in this vapor rust, which is, again, fantastic stuff. Then my next step was to take this apart, which in hindsight, not sure I would pry it apart from the whole thing like I did here. You can see it took me a while and it was a little tricky to get it back together later, which I did not film me getting it back together, but lots of rust and I mean, I'm not upset that I got it apart like that, but and I also found out that a piece of the cast iron to this was 
chipped, but not broken, so it's still functional. Here, once I took it apart, just you can see it's filthy where water's gotten in there and rusted over the years. So, made sure I took a picture. That way, I knew exactly how it was originally assembled, and I could put it back together in the same way. There are multiple springs in here, so when you're taking it apart, you want to pay attention that you don't launch a piece across your workshop, especially if you're working outdoors in a garage or something. I took my time. I didn't know if any of these pieces were going to fly off or if I was going to break any of them, but even with all the rust, none of these ended up being brittle pieces, which was great. And this spring I thought was going to go, but it's set nice and flush for me. So here's what that picture looked like that I took to be able to reassemble it. So all the inner workings of the mortise I left in a smaller jar of evapo rust. That way I, it's a lot easier to me, for me to keep track of them and not lose the smaller pieces. So you can put the brass in evapo rust and it's not going to mess it up. If there's any residual rust that you missed on the wire wheel, it'll come off too. Then here you can see a good bit of wobble in this piece. So just found me a nice flat board and an auto body hammer which works really well. And my whole goal here was just to make this where it was flat and wouldn't be protruding on any sides. And filming with one hand, not the best thing. I should have just waited and got the GoPro and set it up, but I didn't. So this little green, what looks like clay, is a polishing compound. And then I just use the fiber wheel to polish it up. And clearly I need to tighten the wing nuts on my <laughs> grinder and winding wheel. Wire wheel, excuse me. So after showing you what I did here, I did take it, put the camera down and keep doing it with two hands. And and when I got finished, I just took some mineral spirits to get rid of all the residual grime and any of the black residue that would have left over from that wire, excuse me, fiber wheel. So it looks a lot better than it did in that initial picture. So after sitting overnight, I took all these pieces out. And the main focus here of this portion of the video is just to show the mortise once you get it pulled out and kind of wipe off the vapor rust. You can see it's just so much cleaner. That stuff just works great. So after taking them all out of here and drying them, I used a, just a flathead screwdriver to scrape off the old paint that was still left over and then off camera took it back to the wire wheel yet again. Most of that paint that was sticking around comes off pretty easily. Then I took a little bitty wire wheel, put it in the drill, and went in all the little crevices and nooks and crannies of the inside of the mortise. So this was my one of the more enjoyable parts, which is trying to dissect, clean up, and get this whole mortise and lock set back together. So here, using acetone to clean it off before I spray paint it. So I took it outdoors and put two or three coats, I can't quite remember, of black spray paint. And then once that dried, put two coats of clear lacquer on top of it. That way it would keep it looking pretty a little bit longer. Yes, it's going to be inside the doors. So nobody's going to see it, but it's the whole principle. I want it to look as good as possible. So if somebody takes it out for whatever reason, it should still look like it's pretty nice.
than the brass deadbolt, I just use the Dremel, put a little polishing wheel on it, and then put some flits on there, which I didn't leave it in the camera in the camera shot. But my favorite part of polishing these up is putting them on the lathe. You can see they're pretty gray and dirty looking. So use this to get rid of any of the kind of rougher bumps. My goal was not to make it brand new, but still make it look pretty cool. So after you sand it, just wiped on some flits. So it's a polishing compound, basically, is what I'm getting at. Or you can use Brasso, any others, but I've tried a couple of them. They similar results for me. So just take some shop towels and it's pretty impressive how much grime you can get and how much that polish makes a difference. So you can see it's pretty filthy just on the first go round. But to me I find this one of those oddly satisfying kind of videos. So I did intentionally leave it. I sped it up a little bit, but I still left it a lot longer portion of this because it's so satisfying to me. And that's the joy of YouTube. If you don't like any of these portions of the videos, just skip ahead. So I'm pretty satisfied with it. I did not care about getting rid of any of the dents or old character from the past, just wanted to make it clean. And this is what all the different pieces look like. You can see the exterior plate here. It's not showing up brass like the other, so I don't know if it was copper plated, brass plated, whatever it was, but we'll take care of it. And just for reference, you can see what it looked like beforehand. And then there's the after shot. So then, this portion is going to be a little lengthy, so as always, feel free to skip ahead. But I wanted to show how it is. It's essentially a puzzle, trying to put it all back together, especially since I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to replicate what I saw in the picture and put it back together. But this is the one piece that, if you watch, you'll see it launch out on me at least three times, maybe more. See, there's the first one. Didn't use any bad words, because I knew it was going to happen, and... It's just funny to me. And that phone picture is off camera somewhere, so you, that's what I'm looking at when I'm putting these pieces back in. brass buttons here I'm pretty positive something's missing or something's wrong in here because there's nothing connecting to them to the lock so it just seems like there should be another piece somewhere that would help you lock the door this way but I didn't have any extra pieces so I'm not sure think I'm dead I'm trying to <laughs> keep a bomb from going off the way I'm so scared here. Yep, there it is. So 
this last little piece that's over to the right. I have no clue where it's supposed to go. Maybe it's supposed to go on top of the spring that I keep launching out of here to keep it from launching out. I couldn't tell, so I just set it back in there. There we go. Was that three times? I feel like I'm playing operation. Stop scaring me. Well, I this is thing. So in the picture, it was just floating. I don't know where that little spring goes. So I give up. I was too worried. That, like right here, it might sit on top. Who knows? But at this point, just wanted to get it put back together so it wouldn't fly off anymore. Four times was enough for this one portion. I didn't even want to walk away and get a screwdriver, so I tighten this down as much as I could with my fingernail. And I did tighten it down with a screwdriver later. I just didn't want to have any pieces come loose. But I was pretty pleased with this. I feel like I did a good job on it. Now it's time to focus on this. This is the exterior plate, which you can see the rust over the years made it really pitted. Didn't realize I had my video out of sequence here. So anyway, before I put that Bondo on, I did take it to the wire wheel and get off as much of the residual stuff that I could. Here comes the four-legged supervisor to make sure I'm not messing anything up. So I'm not good at this body filler. You'll see it later. I ended up going through a good five or six times of trying to get this right. So once it dried, I got it sanded kind of smooth and then felt like it looked pretty good and took it outside and painted it and it was wrong. So before I painted actually took acetone. You can see just what a hack job. So I ended up sanding off pretty much all of that paint just because it was such a terrible job. So repeated these steps a good four or five times overall, and then finally it ended up working out pretty well for me. You'll see it at the end video. I messed up the uh, filming and pressed play when I was trying to press start and stop when I was trying to press start, etc. Anyway, so here I got a skeleton, skeleton key off a big online retailer, and they're kind of generic templates, so you have to shape it down yourself. this took a lot of trial and error because the opening on that mortise is a lot smaller than I thought it was so it took me a lot of filing and on the end here it's the only way I can do it is just by hand but once I got that piece where it could fit and go inside the mortise I knew I was in a good spot so at that point put it on the lathe and then the rest of the shaft was a little bit thicker than the end where the opening was so just took it there and used it and it was a lot easier but after a good hour hour and a half of filing you can see that I finally got it where it works so I guess that extra piece maybe goes to something but not enough to worry about so after I got the key the way I wanted just took some vegetable oil that I have sitting in a container and then just took the torch and superheated this key for quite a while. 
So this is hot blowing where in the BB gun video, if you watch that, you saw me do cold blowing where you just kind of paint on the blowing. But here you just use a lot of heat and then when you throw it in the, in the oil, it turns it darker and then gives it a little bit more strength. So it cools down pretty quickly. So you can see it's a little bit darker already. It's not really dark, but I ended up doing this two times. So after the first one, you can see it's darker than it was. And then after the second time, you can see it's even darker. It's got that kind of cool old antique patina look. But it, that look does disappear pretty quickly once you use the key a few times. So now I've moved on to the door. The first step is get rid of all the easy, big, loose stuff. So this is the exterior side, and it flaked off in no time. But it's definitely it's satisfying, but at the same time, it was really labor-intensive process just from a time standpoint. Clearly it's not hard work from a <laughs> sweat and effort standpoint. But lots of time. And when you do the scraping like this, it does help save you sandpaper. So there's a bunch of old grime on the window that I just used a paint scraper to get it off. So when I've finished, this is what it looks like without sanding. That was purely just scraping. See, the, even after scraping, there's still some water sitting in there. And then here's the rotten spots. I pulled all the dead, decayed pieces off and got out most of that white wood filler. And then took it outside, and there was still a good bit left, so I started out with 80 grit sandpaper. And there you can see the trim. So here I've got the air compressor going, so this guy is nervous and as soon as you spray it one time, he's, he's out of there. So I use the air compressor to spray out any of the dust and grime out of the, the joints where the different boards come together. And here what I'm doing is Mixing, mixing up some oxalic acid in warm water and then took it out. The interior side was not too bad so I didn't go too wild on bleaching all the wood but again even if it's just one or two spots you're worried about it's a good idea to go ahead and do the entire section to make it more consistent and even. You don't want a bleached spot and then non-bleached spots on top of each other. And then this is the exterior side where even after sanding that those two dark spots came up a little bit but the bleach the intent is to get rid of some of that work so as soon as you're finished bleaching just wet it down once it dries and get rid of any of the excess so here I'm drying it and then as it's finished drying just taking a nail punch and getting in it any of these old brad nails that are kind of sticking out around the different spots. And here you can see after blowing out the most of the dust and grime, you can see right through that door. So hopefully somebody actually wants to use this door and if so, I don't want any air coming through. So knocked out any other stuff I could with just a razor knife. We'll take care of that once we get inside. So here are more old white wood filler that the prior, some of the past had used. So I got rid of most of it that I could, and what I couldn't, I have my own oak wood filler that will take care of that and make it where it's not so obvious that it's white.
Then here my plan, once I had all the joints cleaned up, I took two of my stronger clamps and squeezed them just to see if there was any movement in the door. So I squeezed them as hard as I could and the gaps didn't disappear, which it's not a bad thing. It just tells me that it's not something that I can put wood glue in there and just have it stay. So since they're not going anywhere, I'll take some resin and fill in the gaps. Before I do that, there's a board on top, board on bottom, and the goal there is so that my clamps don't leave marks in the door. And then also the top one here is a guide for my router. So I had good intentions of vacuuming out the dust as I'm going, but it didn't work. I don't know why I didn't quit the first time. You can see it filling my pockets. And apparently there was a nail in there that I never saw. But glad it was my little trim router and not the saw stop. And the goal here is that rotten wood that was near the door, but with all the door hardware, door hardware, easy for me to say, is I just want to get rid of all that and replace it with some new solid wood. There you go, now I have a smooth groove that I can fill with a new piece of scrap wood. So I had two pieces of scrap that were really close. Couldn't tell which one, so then I just ended up going with the one that's a little bit darker of the two. So off camera, I got it cut to size and chiseled out the edges on the door so that way this would sit in there nice and flush. this piece if I had paid attention I wouldn't have put the glue all the way down since there's a little bit of an opening in the door itself. And again this video is longer than normal because I didn't some of the spots I just left in real time without doing the time lapse. I like when I trim something up off camera, it makes it look like I did everything nice and right the first time. If you've seen any of my other videos, you know that's not true. Alright, so I let that sit overnight, added a third clamp before, uh, or excuse me, after I finished filming. Then once that was set, just got a little block plane and made it where it was flush with the door. Still learning how to use these planes well, but at least I finally have a sharp blade on one. You wouldn't know it because there's not really shavings. Like Everybody else shows. One day I'll figure it out. So, after using the plane, you can see it's pretty flush. Not a bad little fix. And then the color, it looks a lot lighter here, but we'll work on that later. And then at this point, it's just a little 
quick run of 150 grit sandpaper to make it completely flush with everything else. So now I'm using the tinted wood filler rather than that old white wood filler that you saw in the previous. So I didn't fill anything and everything, but I did go through any of the bigger gaps and then just a light sanding after the fact. So here I laid out painter's tape before I did the resin, the epoxy down in the gaps. And I debated leaving it clear, but I decided to go ahead and put in some black tint. I think it looks alright. Clear might have been fine too, but I like the black look when you see the finished product. With the black tint, it ends up looking a good bit like venom. So my cameraman here was telling me that it's a symbiotic fluid that we were adding to the cracks here. And I do have tape on the bottom too so that way it doesn't go all the way through and land on the floor. You can see it does settle in there pretty pretty well and then you'll have to go back a second time. But. And I can't stress enough, make certain you use the some kind of painter's tape or something to keep this stuff off of the pieces that you don't want to do or you're going to face a whole lot of cleanup and it's, it's not enjoyable. It's a kind of inefficient use of your time. But this stuff basically just turns into plastic kind of rubber. And you can get most of it off. You can see this is what I've left myself. It's not bad. There are a few little voids that I went back off camera and filled those, but you can see the painter's tape even adhered to some of it. But nothing that the sander can't fix. But this is what happens if you let it go over too much. Then when you start sanding it just turns into kind of a gummy mess and you go through a lot more sandpaper. And this took me a good bit of time to get rid of those sections. So after that was taken care of, I actually went back and used the card scraper to level it out even further and it's nice. The card scraper does get it a little more even than my sander will. Gets rid of those divots and you actually see some of the wood kind of shine a little bit. But here it was nice going through it, no splinters. That's always enjoyable. And you can see my patchwork is a little bit closer to the bare wood that was underneath the plates. And you can see painter's tape came off or pretty flush on most of it. Some of those spots that were a little deeper I did put some wood filler in there. And then here that divot I ended up scratching out any of the kind of grime and dirt and just old residue from over the years. Then once I had it done, I took a wet washcloth and used it just to see if this would work. I didn't spend a whole lot of time, I just wanted to test it. But if you have a small dent or something in wood, you can take a damp cloth and then put the iron on top and the heat will make it raise the grain. So again, I just didn't want it to be quite as deep, so it's purely trial and error, and figured I'd give it a shot. Then on the other side, repeated the same process. I didn't even follow up on this one when I was finished to see what it looked like. I'll have to look at the end of the video and see. And in here, you can't really tell, but I'll use the 
well, this is a dye stain that I'm using, but on that little scrap board in front of me, I've put the wood filler on there and then I'm using this dye stain to test it out and see how it reacts and what the colors will look like. So you see it's very light. It's the first go around. This one's the lightest of all, then the other two I would make it a little bit darker and try different things, but since it's a water-based stain, it's easy to clean up and easy to wipe off, which is why I've tried it too. So you can see you can you feel like you put it too dark or too much and take it right back off. So I felt like that was close enough match after I toyed with it and then put it on a piece of wood here. And to me it's basically good enough for government work as I say. So it matched up pretty well. Right here getting the side where the lock me mechanism will come through. And the four-legged supervisor feels like I did a pretty good job on it, so at that point I stopped on this piece. This is where it got tricky and I got frustrated and kind of gave up on after about five attempts. So this is the first go-round. I spent all this time with two different size brushes and went through the filler and it took a while. It ended up looking really pink on some of them and I didn't like it so I made it darker and then I didn't like that and ended up after not liking something a few times I gave up and just left it with the final one. And here the intent is putting pre-stained conditioner so that way I'm not staining it but it'll keep the color more consistent. Which all I did was put uh, outdoor polyurethane on it. And I didn't mind. Extra step or not, I like it. So this is what it looks like after the first step. You can see my ironing work got up a little bit. But here I think this is, I guess this would be, make it my fifth turn. So at this point I had made it darker and ended up liking this more than I did originally. So you can see it's more pink on the one in the distance than if you wipe it. And the wood does soak up that stain more than the wood filler, of course, so you'll have a dark ring around any of the spots that you put filler, which it, you can call it character. It could be annoying or could be called character. All depends on the individual person. And since I didn't want to do it a seventh time, I called it character. And here, this is about the only patch I did on, well it's not about, it is the only patch I did. So I took another piece of that scrap wood and marked it out on this decorative trim. Just getting some rough measurements first and then I can always fine tune it once it's in place. So I got it cut to length and then marked the angles so I could take care of those. So I bought me a sharpener and my chisels are sharper than they were in the past. Once you get it started you can see here. So not exactly like a glove, but it does fit in place and I can fine tune it here shortly. So coming up I tried something which did not work for me, but it sounded good in theory. So I put it over some boiling water for a good 30 minutes to an hour, which again you should have done it longer if you really wanted to try it. But My thought is kind of like steam bending, but it's such a small piece that it's tricky to steam it anyway. and my process is far from scientific, so lots of 
Lots of steam that got out of the way. But nonetheless, it still served its purpose. So there's the four legged supervisor. He doesn't want me narrating, apparently. So once I get it tacked in, put a clamp on there, which right in the center, and that does kind of help bend it, contour it just a little bit. And after letting that sit for a few hours, came back, had my little micro plane to get the top edges. I was kind of nervous that I was going to take a big gouge and rip it out, but it worked out. Then here to even it up with the top, I sanded with the grain on the large parts. I did not want sand, sand grooves going on. So then I got it to the same height and depth, and after that went with some uh, cheap hand tool, hand chisels that I got at Harbor Freight just to try it out. I think this set of six of those is probably ten bucks. And with it being kind of a rugged antique door, I, I did not spend a whole lot of time being really precise which works out because the other ones look rough from over the years and for me to be kind of sloppy with it worked out really well. So you can see right now it just looks kind of like the, uh, the wood filler that we did but came back in with that stain that I'd put on. And again, remember, any end grain or any indentions, indentations you make on something, it's always going to be a little darker. So wiped off the excess and it matched up decent. And here, this is some polyurethane that I'd not used before. And it, I like the look of it at the end of the day. But ended up doing three coats of this stuff so the outside is certainly more protected than it ever was. So I ended up going in all the little nooks and crannies first and then got coverage and then took it and got, went long brush strokes all the way down so I wouldn't have any overlap. You know I find the, the video portions of staining and seeing this kind of stuff is satisfying as well. So it just really makes all the grain pop in this wood. So I'm glad I spent the extra time on sanding, using the card scraper and all that, but up close you can see the, the wood filler certainly is not ideal. So if this was new, new project, I would have needed to spend a good bit more time making that prettier than it is. But again, this is a zoomed in version. Once you see it from a distance, it's not that bad. And like I said earlier, it's character. Here, just scraping off the excess while you're standing. Again, this is the end view. This is the interior portion of the door, which is so smooth. I really like. There's my patchwork. Turned out to be pretty good. Yeah, I know it's darker than the other pieces, but let it go. And there's the portion from underneath that I patched up. So here, the glass had lots of scratches, which weren't for me, most of them. <laughs> but there were some that I think I did sanding, but I, I didn't look at the pre-work video enough to figure it out. But what I'm doing here is mixing up baking soda and water, and then just taking a microfiber towel and using it to take care of some of the small scratches in the glass. 
It worked on some. It wasn't perfect, but it was yet another trial and error kind of thing. So uh, it's better than when I found it. I'll say that it wasn't perfect, and there's still plenty of marks on that glass. But I don't know another way that's really efficient with my time and money to fix it. Not a big fan of cleaning windows, so I was able to recruit some help. So you figure, when I first got it, I had to use a paint scraper to clean the glass. So the fact that it's this clear after using some glass cleaner is not bad. But again, you can see there's some surface scratches all around the edge. and I really don't think I did it with the sander, because I don't remember I don't remember using the sander around that decorative trim, but who knows, maybe I did. So now that the glass is, fin is clean and the finish is on there, it's time to install the hardware. So I did not go back and have this deadbolt rekeyed. figured if anybody's going to use this, they'd either want their own or may have to do it to match their key. So I figured I'd save myself the time and effort on it, but we shall see. Here you can see the exterior screws did not have that brass look to them. So what I did is the exterior plate and the exterior screws, I took them and used some gold automotive paint and then put a clear coat on top of that. And again, I'm kind of bummed I did miss my work on that exterior plate so you can see exactly what I did. But that's what it looks like. So you can see, after all that work, I was able to make it look much better than I did earlier when you saw the Bondo and paint. But the point there was my doorknob was spinning wildly and it's because the interior shaft here is shot. So the way you figure out what you need is put the teeth at the measurement and count the number of little teeth in each inch. So I needed 20 teeth per inch and ended up getting one off a online retailer after some searching. But here we go. This is the before. Clearly the hardware is really noticeable and then the water stains and dark view here on this door leaves a lot to be desired. But all in all, I have to say I'm really pleased with the work I did on this and just kind of bummed that the filming, even with as long as this video is, didn't go as planned. But here we are, this is the after. Here, There are no more gaps where air is going to flow through. Again, the black resin, I think I like it better than what clear would have looked like. There's the interior portion of this door. Again, skeleton key. I like that I was able to get that going. The knob's not 100% perfect, but it opens. And again, this finish, just love it. It feels great, by the way, too. So here's what the normal interior finish portions look like. And then at the other end down here, you'll see my patch job. Again, we're zoomed in, so of course it's going to be a little bit more noticeable, but when you look at it from the zoomed out version, it blends in pretty well. And then the more drastic change is the exterior portion. So that's the spray painted plate. It's the same original one, but I did spray paint it with gold automotive paint and put primer on it. My patch job came out pretty well, blended nicely. Again, plenty of character. You can see the water stains. There's that little divot that are ironed. And that water stain is much less noticeable. Then there's some more of the wood filler, which, again, character. So I really like 
what this ended up being. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. It doesn't fit any of our doorways. and I am looking to sell it, but I have no clue where to list it. So we'll figure it out. But nonetheless, thanks for watching.